And we'll get started here. Let me start us over on the Facebook. Good morning. Welcome to Houston Oasis. We're glad that you could join us this morning, uh, whether you're joining us uh, on Facebook Live or you're here in the Zoom chat. Houston Oasis is a secular community that meets weekly here in Houston, Texas. Uh, and our core values are people are more important than beliefs. Reality is known through reason. Meaning comes from making a difference. Human hands solve human problems and be accepting and be accepted. So if those sound like good things to you, you're in the right place. We have a great lineup for you this morning. We always have an excellent talk, which we're going to hear today from Phyllis Fry. Uh, but one of the ways we kick off uh, the gatherings each week is with some music, some live music. And we're excited to welcome back an, a guitarist that we had uh, actually on one of our first virtual gatherings when we started this whole thing back in uh, March. And we all went under quarantine. Uh, so we're actually really glad to welcome him back. Houston Oasis, please welcome Mr. Mark Towns. Hello, thanks for having me back and hello from Los Angeles, where I am uh, quarantined.
Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. And the jazz hands are going wild in the Zoom chat. I, I've said it before. I had one week a little studio applause button. I need to bring it back so I can hit it so you can hear the <laughs> reaction after you finish. But we really appreciate you coming back and playing for us uh, this Sunday. So thanks. And we'll hear a little bit more, I should mention, from Mark uh, later in the gathering as well. Uh, but for now, uh, let's have our main talk. And we're excited to welcome someone back to Oasis who's spoken to us at the in-person gatherings and now back uh, for a virtual gathering, Phyllis Fry. Phyllis Randolph Fry is an Eagle Scout, a former member of the Texas A&M Corps of Cadets, a veteran, an engineer, an attorney, a father, a grandmother, and a lesbian wife. She is also the first out transgender judge in the nation. Uh, and there's a, just an incredible uh, story about Phyllis Fry. We're going to hear some more of that. There's a great New York Times piece, I should mention, that was done on Phyllis. So if you get a chance, uh, maybe after the gathering today, make sure to Google Phyllis Fry, New York Times. Uh, but for now, uh, let's hear from her herself. Houston Oasis, please welcome Phyllis Fry. Well, thank you very much. I pushed the unmute button. I hope you can hear me. Okay, good. Um, First, I want to say to Mark, thank you for your talent. Uh, I played guitar for a number of years. Never was I as good as you, but I enjoyed my guitar. And I enjoyed speaking to Oasis. Golly, it had to be five or six years ago, I think. Uh, a lot's happened since then, uh, and it's been challenging, but uh, it's been good. Let me start uh, with the main thing I wanted to say today is that several weeks ago, as many of you know, the Supreme Court of the United States rendered a decision that said with respect to uh, Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act dealing with employment discrimination based on sex, that uh, at that time, both sexual orientation 
that's lesbian, gay, bisexual people, and gender identification, that's transgender people like myself, were covered. That was the end of a 44-year struggle that I started back in 1976. And 1976, in June, in fact, it was the very week that the Supreme Court just rendered its decision. Uh, I was at the end of my two weeks notice because I had been fired for being trans by a local engineering company. Uh, I was later blackballed by the entire Houston engineering community. And prior to that, I was run out of the military, even though I had a regular army uh, commission as a, as a first lieutenant. So I've been facing a lot of job discrimination and I was fed up and I filed with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission back, back then, 44 years ago, and they investigated and told me there was no doubt that I'd been discriminated against but uh, the current law, the federal appeals courts that were ruling on that issue at that time said that transgenders were not covered uh, as discrimination based on sex. And so uh, I started my struggle. Uh, one of the things I did was I lobbied the Houston City Council for four years to get rid of the cross-dressing ordinance that made uh, me subject to arrest every day I walked out uh, of the house either to look for a job or to go to law school uh, or, or whatever. And I began to uh, fight within the uh, Texas Democratic Party uh, to get transgender included along with lesbian and gay. I fought with the local Houston then gay political caucus to get transgenders included. And uh, in 1991, I was fed up with the fact that I was getting uh, mailings because the internet really hadn't caught on yet in 1991. I know some of y'all are young, you can't figure what it was like back then, but the internet wasn't, wasn't cranking folks. And I used to get all kinds of mail outs from national organizations and that were clearly uh, lesbian and gay uh, advocates that would not include transgender. So I founded the International Conference on Transgender Law and Employment Policy. Uh, and we had six consecutive conferences starting in 1992 in Houston. Uh, we began lobbying in Washington. We had already been lobbying in Austin for transgender uh, rights. And uh, when we were in uh, the D.C. area in 1995, it was then that we learned that the Human Rights Campaign uh, had decided that transgenders were not going to be included in the, uh, uh, in the uh, end of the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, which had been offered at that time, because uh, they were afraid that we would kill the bill. So that began a 13 year fight with the HRC, as it's known. Uh, by the way, uh, I just about became uh, involved in the internet at that time and uh, started what was called the filibuster, which was the early days of blogging. And uh, in, in 2008, after a long struggle that I led, uh, HRC uh, and then Congressman Barney Frank it decided that it would be best to include transgenders along with lesbian, gay, bisexuals in the struggle for our rights. So uh, HRC and I have been friends since 2008. Uh, everything's been rocking along pretty well since then. But uh, my assertion is that if I had not started back then in 1976 and continued in the way that I did for transgender inclusion, we would have had a Supreme Court decision uh, just last month, which would have definitely included lesbians and gays and bisexuals 
but that transgenders would not have been probably in the initial lawsuit and would not have been in the decision. So I'm very proud of it. Um, I'm not sure exactly what else to say, except that I have, um, you're right, I am the first out transgender judge in the United States, but over the years, uh, and I'm gonna say it here too, um, I have asserted that there's a possibility I might be the first transgender judge out of the closet um, on the planet, in the world. And you know how the internet is. If somebody is going to challenge you, they'll challenge you. If somebody's going to say you're wrong, they'll say you're wrong. And I've been saying this now for five years and no one has yet said that I was wrong. So I will continue to say I'm the first out transgender judge in the United States and possibly in the world. Uh, it has been an exciting um, life. Uh, there were definite pitfalls. Um, during the early days of the struggle, I um, could not get a job. I could not get a job. And once I became an attorney, none of the few out um, lesbian gay law firms here in Houston would hire me or mentor me. Uh, it wasn't until 1986 that I realized that over the years with the Houston then called Gay Political Caucus, I had um, been uh, uh, <clears throat> screening political candidates for judgeships. And uh, so a lot of the judges knew who I was. So I went to them and asked them if they would appoint me to represent indigent clients in the criminal courts. And several of them gave me a try. And about a year later, I had more work that I knew what to do with. Uh, in 2004, I joined with uh, John Metchman and Jerry Simino to uh, uh, form the, uh, a law firm here and uh, as a partner. And even though uh, Jerry has gone on to be a judge and John has gone with another partner, Mitchell Bettine, a very good law firm. Uh, I still am uh, with the original law firm started in 2004, along with my partner, Sal Benavides, and my other partner, Kashmir Terry. I don't practice very much anymore. Uh, I pretty much limited my practice over the last couple of years to taking transgender people through the courts uh, some as young as five years old, some in their late 80s to get their uh, documents changed with respect to their uh, gender and their name. Um, <clears throat> recently, uh, 10 months ago, I've had just kind of put everything on hold. My wife of 47 years, she stayed with me through my transition and through all of the stuff that we went through uh, she had a uh, malignant tumor in her head, and, and she wasn't supposed to live more than four months. Well, uh, it's been 10 months now, and uh, they keep tweaking her meds, and right now she's doing pretty good. And over the last five years, I've been dealing with my own cancer, and they recently come out with a brand new med, and um, I'm doing pretty good. So we're here living in a senior living facility. Uh, about two miles from the law office, and uh, uh, Sal and Kashmir and the other attorneys in the office um, continue to practice uh, long, and I'm just kind of holding on. So that's about all I have to say right now. Thank you, Phyllis, and um, and everyone is uh, just we're just so thankful to. I've had you here uh, to share some thoughts and we're getting lots of comments on our Facebook people that are saying we're proud of you and, and talking about obviously the amazing accomplishments over your life. And so uh, we are honored by your presence. And I should mention that um, we're getting, uh, we're actually gonna start getting a few questions in. So here's what we're gonna do. Uh, we're actually gonna take a minute to do the community thing, right? Oasis is a secular community. So uh, we're gonna take some time to sort of do, 
Oh, go ahead, Phyllis. Uh-huh. There, there's, there's, I want to make sure that if people want the whole story, you, you promote it. Uh, Google New York Times, colon, Phyllis Fry. I was on the front page above the fold of a Sunday edition of the New York Times in August of 2015. It's an extensive article with lots of pictures. And the other thing is um, <clears throat> two very good authors, Michael Long and Shay Tuttle, have written my book. It's called Her Honor, and hopefully it'll come out in the fall. So be on the lookout for it. Okay, I said what I needed to say. And actually, I posted that link to uh, in the New York uh, to the New York Times article. I just posted it when Phyllis was mentioning it uh, a second ago in the chat on Zoom, as well as on the Facebook. So here's what we're going to do. Let's take about uh, 10 minutes to sort of break up if you're on our Zoom on our breakout rooms. If you're on our Facebook Live, this is a good opportunity to have some conversation, maybe about some of the things that uh, Phyllis brought up. Well, after about 10 minutes, we're going to come together and we're going to have a question and answer session with Phyllis. Uh, and so you'll have an opportunity to ask questions, um, and we're already getting some of those through. Uh, this is also a good time to take a break if you'd like to, or maybe read that article, and maybe that'll spark some questions as well. So with that, uh, Abishtek, go ahead and kick off our breakout rooms, and on the Facebook, we're going to be back in about eh, 10 minutes uh, for a Q&A session with Phyllis Fry. Thanks. Yeah, we'll do uh, just the 10 minute breakout room uh, and then we'll just do a lot of, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A because I think we'll get a lot of questions uh, today, so. Some other leaders in the trans community, we went to uh, lobby him in his office and he could really be nasty. He was, he, he, as we understood it, he had taken so much grief during Clinton's don't ask, don't tell um, passage, um, dealing with uh, gay people in the military, that uh, he wasn't going to take more grief about transgenders, period, because he knew uh, all the questions in the comments would deal with restrooms and showers. And as anybody who knows what's happened over the last 10 years in various states, various attempts, um, various administrations, especially the current one, to try to um, limit transgenders, the fights have always been restrooms and showers and stuff like that. Well, around 2006 or so, when they were fixing to introduce a new version of ENDA, uh, they left us out, they being HRC and Barney Frank, they left us out again. And so I got onto the filibuster. I, by then I had a pretty good list and um, sent out the word. And as it turned out, uh, we, we being myself and all of the people that had attended the six uh, conferences that I had in the 90s and, and all the people that they had trained, these are mostly transgender people um, down two or three or four generations. Um, <clears throat> they had um, gotten uh, local and state and regional organizations all to stand as one against HRC and Barney Frank over the end of bill and say transgenders will be included. And um, that was pretty much the end of that fight, um, but in 2008, HRC officially, officially adopted the transgender mission in its uh, policy, um, and so that was the end of that fight. I have seen Barney Frank a couple of times and have uh, met him a couple of times, and um, I don't know if he doesn't know who I am or he doesn't remember who I am, uh, but uh, it's never been worn. All right, and so we're going to get a, some more faces in the mix here. We have a question from uh, Dennis Fair, and Dennis, you can unmute yourself on your side. All right, you hear me all right? Yep. Okay. 
I've noticed as an activist for various causes over my career that um, there are some ardent, sincere feminist women who are racist, uh, ardent GLBT activists who are opposed to the trans movement, ardent anti-racist activists who are homophobic, etc. Why are people on the receiving end of discrimination so often unable to empathize with other forms of it? Well, that's a good question. And I wish I knew what the answer is. And I will tell you that while we're sitting here today, I'm wearing my own Black Lives Matter t-shirt. Um, and I um, uh, am hopeful that this, this entire Trump thing and this um, George Floyd and the protests that are coming out uh, is going to make a change in some of that. Because if you look at the protesters, there's so many Caucasian people that are marching uh, with the Black Lives Matter and against police brutality, against people of color. I'm hopeful because of the fact that the demographics on this horrible pandemic that we're going through is showing that uh, uh, Blacks and other people of color, including um, Hispanic and Latin Latinx people, uh, are bearing a disproportionate uh, burden with respect to both illness uh, and deaths. I'm also excited about the fact that we are becoming uh, used to the term essential workers during this pandemic. And anybody with a brain cell knows that uh, the essential workers are disproportionately people of color. Uh, and even this morning in the uh, Houston Chronicle, and you might want to Google up the Houston Chronicle this morning because there's an article where uh, black transgender people are trying to interface with uh, black people who are not LGBTQ um, inclusive. It's just, you know, it's, you just gotta keep on and keep it on is all I can say. And the only person you can be responsible for is yourself. Um, and you need to tell people that we've been dealing with this garbage for 401 years since slaves were first brought to this so-called room is free. Um, that's about all I can say. I know sometimes when someone sees my Black Lives Matter t-shirt, they say, well, don't you think that white lives matter? And I say, well, of course white lives matter, uh, but white lives have always mattered. Uh, it's time for white people to recognize what's been going on for all these decades, and especially what's been going on uh, in the recent. And it's time for uh, pe pe people who are not people of color to stand up and be vocal and uh, stand up for black people and other people of color and indigenous uh, Native American people and other minorities who constantly uh, I know this is going to be broadcast and we're not supposed to curse, but have been shit upon. So uh, it's it's a one person at a time thing and I'm doing my thing and I invite you to do your thing. But I think to stay uh, for PG-13, we do get one S. So we, we just used it. So that's good. We're still under the, the <laughs> and that was a good usage too. Uh, okay. So uh, let's see. Uh, let's head over to the Facebook Live. I should mention, if you uh, have questions for Phyllis, keep them coming on the Facebook uh, conversation and on the Zoom conversation. Ray Ramirez on the Facebook uh, Live says, we are proud of Phyllis. So that's a comment he has. But he also asked, um, are there any transgender individuals on the ballot this November? So I guess I could go for local or uh, the answer state. Is, the answer is I'm sure there are. And the way to find out is to Google uh, the Victory Fund. Uh, the Victory Fund, uh, its current CEO is Anise Parker, who's the former mayor 
uh, Houston, a very much out lesbian, the first um, LGBT uh, person who was the mayor of a major city, uh, a good friend of mine, um, uh, and she's the one who made me a judge back in 2010. But the Victory Fund uh, is one that works with uh, candidates uh, running for office and those candidates being uh, LGBTQ. So that's the best way to find out that answer. And we'll stay on the election topic for just a second. Uh, Ami had asked what your thoughts are about the integrity of the upcoming election. Well, I'm excited about it. Um, and, but I'm also concerned and I'm not so concerned about what's gonna happen on November the 3rd. In my personal opinion, there are so many people that are angry right now um, that um, we will elect Joe Biden. But if we do not elect him resoundingly, then um, the current president is going to not want to give up. He is going to claim that it was illegitimate. And what worries me the most is the time between November the 4th and January the 19th, because he will have a full 10 weeks. God knows what he's going to do if he loses that election in those 10 weeks. God knows what he's going to do if he wins the election in those 10 weeks. It's kind of like when the uh, Republican Senate refused to convict him on the impeachment charge. He's gone even crazier than he was before since uh, the Republican Senate gave him a carte blanche. So I don't know, but uh, um, I'm really worried about what's going to happen between November the 4th and January the 19th. He's got 10 weeks to make it worse. And uh, Susan Thompson on that, uh, in that, uh, had asked related to that, if there were any challenges that have been posed uh, to your area of practice by this administration? No, not, not to me personally, no. No, I, I, I do state law and um, you know, name and gender ID change. I have heard that there have been attempts to uh, make it so that transgenders couldn't change their passports. As far as I know, from the uh, National Center for Transgender Equality, which is a group you might want to Google, the National Center for Transgender Equality. I have not heard uh, anything of that nature. That is a group, if you don't have a place to send your money, that's, a, that's along with the Victory Fund, that's another good place to uh, send your money. And so we have a few different things in here. I should, uh, I'll, I'll kind of throw it open too. If anybody has a video question they would like to ask, you can sort of raise your hand in your box or use your reaction button and uh, we can go that route. But we did have a question uh, from Stephen Rouse on the Zoom chat. Said you had mentioned that the human rights campaign had treated the trans community as second class citizens within the broader LGBTQ community. Is there the same type of stigma toward bisexual persons within the LGBTQ community as well? Well, I'm sure there is, but I don't know about it. I know that uh, in the 1993 march from Washington, uh, which I was a uh, speaker, that uh, bisexuals were included in the name of the march. Um, and I also know that uh, uh, in some of the early, I think it was 95, when I... Uh, uh, was uh, given a Creator of Change Award by the task force at its annual convention in Detroit that year, that uh, there was a bisexual breakout session and there was a transgender breakout session. And the leaders uh, of both uh, sessions met together and decided that instead of having a, a separate breakout, that we would join together and have a joint breakout and learn more about each other and meet each other. And the theory was that the transgender community would carry 
the water for the bisexual community and the bisexual community would carry the water for the uh, transgender community. And uh, we would always ensure that when people were talking about lesbian, gay, and transsexual rights, that we would speak up and say, no, it's lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights. And that the bisexual community, when they heard people talking about lesbian, gay, bisexual rights, they would say, no, 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 it's lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. Right. So as far as I know, from my personal experience, um, the bisexual community has definitely been in the uh, initials uh, of the LGB, and then it was LGBT, now it's LGBTQ. Um, so uh, I think that um, bisexuals can certainly uh, take their place in the community, uh, and if they want to come out as being bisexual rather than uh, merely stay in the lesbian or gay uh, community if they happen to be at that time in a same-sex community. Uh, that's up to them to come out as bi. I don't think there's going to be a problem. I, I haven't heard of one. All right. And do we have any uh, video comments or questions? Anybody that would like to Say anything? I'm looking at all the little boxes here and I don't see anybody. While you're looking for that, I get asked often and I wrote in the uh, afterward to my book, uh, the writer said that I'm supposed to include something about what still needs to be done. And what needs to be done has to do with elder care because um, uh, elder care, I know in a lot of the major cities, that have large uh, LGBTQ communities and community centers. And um, uh, there's a lot of work so that uh, lesbian and gay and bisexual people uh, can uh, congregate and facilitate and get medical and other care um, as an elderly person. Uh, transgenders can avail themselves to that to some extent. The thing with transgender people is that most trans men and most trans women, like myself, um, most of us either can't afford surgery below the waist or uh, it's dangerous because of other medical conditions, be it diabetes, a heart condition, who knows what. And so uh, I'm, I think it's a good guess that more than half of us who are out as trans people uh, have not had any surgical changes below the waist. So what happens when we go into nursing homes? Well, we are going to be treated by people who make the minimum wage and are usually um, steeped in religion, and I know this is true because in 2001, I was in the hospital for two weeks, and I can't tell you how many nurses and caretakers came in to save me, and I pushed the nurse button and told them to get these goddamn people out of here, but um, it's microaggressions. These people are going to be changing our diapers. These people are going to be inserting catheters. These people are going to be dealing in areas and they're going to look below the waist and then they're going to look above the waist and they're going to use the wrong pronouns, either accidentally or in an, in an insulting manner. And when you get a, insults like that several times a day, every day, and you can't do anything about it, that's a good recipe for one depression and to suicide. I will not go into a nursing home. If my life dies before me and I become incapacitated, I will take my life before I will go into a nursing home. Elder care is what needs to be focused on right now for transgender people. What an incredibly important topic and, and uh, something somebody had asked about what sort of some of the next issues or upcoming issues or current issues that transgender individuals were facing. And um, you know, 
that sounds like uh, that's an important Paige one. Paige Williams, my good friend. I love Paige Williams. Paige <laughs> and I uh, met uh, in the guitar circle back about 30 or 40 years, no, about 30 years ago. And um, we met once a month, excuse me, once a week. It was Tuesday night. And we came to a uh, senior living facility and uh, met in their community room. And it just so happened to be the very same facility where Trish and I now live. Uh, and I loved playing my guitar and I loved the people in the group. And um, uh, when we moved here, I sold all but two of my guitars. Uh, my Martin, I gave to a nephew because uh, I knew he would take care of it. And my 12 string, even though I can't play it because of arthritis in my joints and my hand, I kept my 12 string hoping that someday uh, med medical people will come up with a pill to uh, uh, reduce the pain in my left hand and I can start playing my 12 string again. And I'm so glad to see her name pop up. Hello, Paige. And Paige uh, actually is the reason that Phyllis is uh, here today. So Paige, uh, you have the honor of asking the, the last question and saying uh, hi to your friend, go for it. Oh, oh boy, Phyllis, I didn't know you and Trish had been having such a rough time. Um, my question is, there's so much in the news today about black trans women being murdered. And is this accurate that more of them than other trans women are being murdered? And do you have a theory as to why? Uh, yes, it is. Um, I think it's. Uh, I think it has to do with uh, religion, which is one of the reasons why uh, I'm glad that Black trans women are working to interface with the uh, Black community in general. Uh, I think it's, it has a lot to do with the reason that uh, a lot of the black community, again, because of those who are in a lot of the churches uh, don't want to have anything to do with the LGBT community. Um, this goes back, if you remember in Houston, when we had, um, uh, on two different occasions, we had uh, bills that were uh, designed by city council to remove discrimination. Uh, in the city with respect to uh, the then it was called gay community and there was a huge huge uh, uproar and most of the most of the negative votes came out of the black community and most of the black preachers preached against inclusion uh, with uh, the lgbt uh, community i i don't know why um, um, exactly uh, that's happening, but it is happening. And it's good to see your face, sweetheart. All right. And we actually had uh, one last uh, question that came in that's, uh, I think, a, a pretty important question. So I think uh, everybody will forgive us for squeezing one more. And it's going to be from Natalie. And Natalie, go for it. Hey, Phyllis, um, thank you very much for everything that you've been doing. I'm the mother of a trans son. Um, he's 25 and began transitioning about a year ago. He um, had his top surgery and has recently started um, using testosterone. Um, he works with autistic children. He's on the spectrum himself and will be going to get his master's degree. Um, if there's one piece of advice that you could give to a parent of a trans adult, early adult, young adult, um, uh, what, what would it be? Uh, well, you're already doing it. You obviously love and support your son. Uh, my family threw me away. What can I say? Um, but um, make sure and tell everybody about it. You know, wear a big sign on your chest. I'm the parent of a transgender kid. Um, go to the PFLAG. Uh, get involved with uh, uh, any and everything that you can having to do with transgender. PFLAG, uh, even though it's still called PFLAG, because that is a really good uh, monitor, 
Uh, they are very trans and bi uh, inclusive. That was another fight that uh, I was kind of on the sidelines of. Other people fought that fight in the 90s, but PFLAG is very inclusive of trans and bi. So I would suggest that you, uh, you know, just tell everybody, my son's trans, my son's trans, I'm proud of my son. Don't, you know, um, don't hold back. Um, Thank you for that, because I will tell you, it's it's hard being in a, living in a, a conservative community. I mean, most people don't even know that that I'm atheist, you know, much less that I have a trans son. And so, um, but if that's going to support him, then that's what I'll do. You know, I always hear about people who live in conservative communities. Uh, well, okay, but that doesn't mean everybody's conservative. And uh, even if it's a 55-45 or a 60-40 or even a 70-30, that means 30% of the people out there that you haven't met are neat people. And, and the only way you're going to meet them is to be out yourself so that they will come out. And um, um, thank you for loving your son. Oh, very much. Okay. Thank you. Get yourself a t-shirt. I will. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie, and, and thank you, Phyllis. Uh, Houston Oasis, let's give our jazz hands and applause for Phyllis for joining us uh, today. We hope to have you back uh, sometime soon. We appreciate you being here. Well, I had a good time. Thank you very much. And with that, Houston Oasis, uh, the reason this happens every week is because all of you guys uh, show up. We have volunteers that were here at 930 Abishek. While I slept in and missed the alarm, Abishek was here at 9.30 doing our sound check. Um, and so the other way that that happens too is uh, through your donations. And so if you'd like to support the mission of creating secular community here in the Houston area, we're going to post some information in the Zoom chat as well as on our Facebook about how you can uh, donate. You know, we don't, the one-time donations uh, are great, but if you have been attending for a while, we also really encourage you to become a recurring donor. You can sign up at HoustonOasis.org. With that, uh, we would like to welcome back the musician that we had at the top of the, uh, the program. Oasis, let's welcome back Mr. Mark Towns. Just wanted to make sure you can still hear me because I had to unplug and charge my phone. Okay. <laughs>
Mark Towns, Houston Oasis, uh, the jazz hands and applause are going up. Mark, someone had a question. What is that song that you just played? That's uh, Love's in Need of Love Today by Stevie Wonder. Love's in Need of Love Today by look, Stevie Wonder. Look up the lyrics, y'all. Thank you, Mark. And you. Uh, let's see here. A few announcements before we head off, everybody. Uh, first off, join us here next week. We're going to be back. So we have uh, somebody from the uh, Americans United for Separation of Church and State. How do you how do you know when the next Oasis get Sunday gathering is? It's easy. It happens every week at the same time, 1030. You just come back to the same place. You can join our email list at HoustonOasis.org. It gives you the, the links. If you're on Facebook Live, you want to join us in Zoom. That's a good way to get the links each week for the meetings. Uh, but tonight, uh, join us back here for the coronavirus conversation at 8 o'clock. We're going to have two family doctors, uh, Richard Andrews and Will Judy, who will be answering your questions about coronavirus. A uh, lot's happening with that in Harris County right now. Come get your questions answered either on Facebook Live or uh, at the Zoom link. If you'd like to join via Zoom, you can email contact at HoustonOasis.org. And we can get you the link for that. Uh, and then we're also still looking for people during this time of uh, quarantine who would like to receive letters of support from our community members. Maybe you know somebody that is um, in a care home or maybe they just are high risk and they're not able to have a lot of social contact and they, they would like to have uh, maybe receive some of those letters. And so you can email care at HoustonOasis.org with their details and we will make sure to get them uh, involved with that. Uh, with that, everybody, thanks again to Mark Towns and to Phyllis Fry, and we will see everybody back here for Coronavirus Conversation tonight at 8 and back here next week uh, for another Oasis gathering. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week.